Today is November 16, 2006. We're here for an oral history interview with Robert Nauman. Bob, we're delighted to have you here today. I'm Charles Lundquist. Uh, these oral history interviews go into the archives at the University of Alabama in Huntsville and are available online. Bob, we'd like to start out by letting you tell a little bit about where you spent your youth, where you were educated, and how you got into the space program. Uh, well, I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, and uh, went to, I did my undergraduate work at the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa, and uh, I, uh, of course, was very intrigued with the atomic energy program. I remember uh, uh, this was during the time, I guess, of the uh, of the hearings of the House on American Committee, and we were watching uh, Oppenheimer being skewered by the <laughs> by the government. And I thought, well, you know, I miss the atomic era, but I'll be damned if I'm gonna miss the space era. <laughs> so uh, I applied for summer work up here in Huntsville uh, in 1954, I guess it was. Spent the summer up here working in the uh, actually in the same building that Von Braun was in. Uh, didn't really have anything terribly significant to do. I think we mostly corrected old drawings and things like that and, and brought things up to, up to date. And came back in 55, another summer here. And then uh, when I finished my undergraduate work, I came here full time in February of 57. And uh, then I went back uh, for my master's and then later went back for my PhD at Alabama. Um, I remember distinctly the day I was going back for my master's because that was the the day that uh, Explorer 1 was supposed to be launched. <laughs> oh, you had a real yeah. conflict. We had a real conflict, and I had been working on Explorer 1 uh, since we came here, actually with, with Chuck, and I uh, was very anxious to watch the launch. And as it so happened, the, uh, the, the night before I was supposed to go back was the night it was supposed to be launched. And of course, as we all remember, it got scrubbed that night. <laughs> so I had to leave the next day and actually missed it. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I've kind of been here ever since. <laughs> well, let's sort of follow through your career from there. Uh, what organization, uh, when you got here permanently, what organization did you go into? Well, my first uh, organization was actually in the old structures and mechanics uh, division or group. Uh, I worked for Heinz Curla. And uh, mostly what his group was doing was looking at the uh, capabilities of the Russian missiles, that we, what we could learn about them, and calculating what kind of payload they could carry over what uh, distance. So I was doing some orbital calculations, thinking you know, in terms of uh, eventually Explorer 1, or satellite uh, mechanics, and uh, got interested in the problem of the meteoroids. Uh, which appeared to be a possible problem that would limit what we could do in space. And so I started doing quite a bit of reading and, and some calculations on probabilities of uh, uh, vehicles being struck by meteoroids and, and what the effects might be. And then uh, after I came back from my, uh, uh, I guess, from classwork for my master's, uh, I was transferred over to the old research projects division, and I was working with uh, Gerhard Heller and Chuck Lundquist. And I guess our first duties there were uh, getting ready for Explorer 4, which was being ready for the Argus project. And there was some pretty exciting things that went on at that time. I remember. Uh, yeah, why don't you give a summary of the Argus project? A number of the people hearing this probably won't recognize that name since it was kept reasonably quiet for quite a while. Yeah, it sure was. Um, well, let, let me let me just mention something first before okay, that, sure. which I think was kind of amusing. We <laughs> uh, we were working away, getting ready for the Explorer 4 launch, and it was about a week before the launch. And Bill Snotty, my colleague, who was a classmate of mine at the university, had just come to work here. And uh, he got very intrigued. In fact, he was working with uh, Gerhard Heller on the thermal design of Explorer 4, and he got very intrigued with the idea of uh, the, the way the orbit progresses around the Earth and the Sun. And we had a, a requirement that we couldn't uh, tolerate 100% sunlight because the uh, vehicle would get too hot and the batteries would get cooked. 
And so uh, he had built a little model with a, a piece of cardboard representing the orbital plane, put it on a globe, and had a, a desk lamp for the sun, and took the launch date that we, at that time was classified, but you know we were, were privy to it. And he realized that uh, the thing would move into 100% sunlight in, in less than a week. Uh, <laughs> So uh, he showed me what he was doing, and I said, Bill, you're absolutely right. This is, is not going to work. So uh, we stayed up all night with an old Burroughs E-101 calculator, uh, redoing the orbital calculator, or actually the, the launch time calculations of it. I'll never forget that old machine. It had plug boards for subroutines. And we ran out of plug boards, and we needed a cosine subroutine. And we had a young co-op student there, Mary Jo Smith, who was the cosine subroutine. The machine would run, and when it needed a cosine, the little light would flash, and it would ding, and she'd look it up in a table and put it in the machine and run off. And of course, we came up with the right uh, uh, launch time. And then we had to get Heller to uh, sign off on it. Well, he was up in the Smokies camping, <laughs> and so we had the, the highway patrol looking for him so that he could uh, authorize our, our new launch time that we had come up with, just two summer students. Or, well, a summer student and a, a fresh employee, and uh, signed off on it, and uh, we got the launch time changed and had a very successful launch. Um, I might point out that uh, some of the students that had worked on that and were getting ready for it actually got in my old Chevy convertible, and we drove down to the Cape. And, of course, we couldn't tell anybody why I was there because the launch was, was classified. And uh, we went out on the beach and waited for the thing to go and waited and waited and waited and spent the entire night on the beach waiting for it and of course it never did go <laughs> because again it got scrubbed and uh, we had to go back uh, back to Huntsville and then th finally it was launched I think two or three days later so I uh, missed another launch. <laughs> it's probably worth mentioning at this point for the historical record that the Argus project at the time was classified top secret so with just a restricted list of people that knew of it and were working on it. Well, you, you only talked a little bit about it. Yeah, why don't you give a description okay. of the Argus project? It, nobody else has talked about it. Oh, okay. It well, wasn't there weren't very many people very, involved, but it was. It's now all declassified. Yeah, it's a very a, historic event. Very historic. Um, well, the the object of the Argus project. It was actually conceived by a Greek <laughs> elevator, <laughs> let's see, repairman or something like that. He was yeah. an electrical engineer anyway. <laughs> elevator engineer. Elevator engineer, I think. He was named Nicholas Christophilus. And he had come up with the idea that one could detonate nuclear weapons in the magnetic field above the Earth's atmosphere and could trap enough fission fragments and other debris that would be charged on the magnetic lines of force, which would then circulate around the, the Earth very much like the Van Allen belts do, but would be very intense, and maybe intense enough to be able to fry the electronics of an ICBM coming in. So this might be a missile defense idea. So that was what it was put forth. And uh, so the Department of Defense, or I guess at the time the, uh, let's see, it was AFSWIC at the time, wasn't the Atomic Special Weapons? Yes, they Sutter, were involved. They were involved right. in it. I think uh, uh, ARPA, or ARPA. ARPA, yeah. Yeah, ARPA was involved. And uh, Lockheed was involved in it. They had sounding rockets. And uh, so Explorer 4's task with its radiation counters in there was to actually monitor the uh, this Argus shell of electrons and other fission fragments that was to be put around the Earth in the detonation of these small nuclear weapons. And so there were actually three shots uh, in the Argus program. Uh, they were launched on an X-17 uh, from a guided missile frigate, I think it was, I don't remember the name of the ship, down in the South Atlantic. And uh, this was in the summertime, but of course in the South Atlantic that would be wintertime. And it was a pretty rough seas down there. I remember they had what, a State 7C or State 5 or whatever it was. And uh, some pretty exciting things took place during the launch. The uh, the device was actually armed, if I remember correctly, by the accelerometer on the first stage. And then it was it was ticking and ready to go off while the other stage is fired. And I believe on the first launch, the upper stage didn't fire. And so we wound up detonating at only 50, 50 miles above the Earth. 
And it turned out over a weather station, I believe. <laughs> but fortunately, it was still high enough. There, nobody even knew it happened. These were small yield. Yeah, these were about 20 kT, if yeah. I remember correctly. And so anyway, it was not terribly successful. The second one, I think, didn't quite achieve the altitude it was supposed to. But the third one really did, and we, we really got a, a very incredible um, set of data from Explorer 4. We uh, were running course in and out of the uh, radiation belt, and we had the orbit of it. And so we had a, a group of summer students there that summer, and I was involved with them. And uh, we had these long, long strip charts that we were laying out on the floor and then matching where we saw the radiation appear or the radiation belt appear and matching that to the orbit and so forth and building a model of the so-called Argus shell and pretty exciting times. Probably uh, the most fun I've ever had. <laughs> now you, you didn't mention that there was another fleet. There was a fleet in the North Atlantic to observe the What's called the conjugate effects yeah. of the atomic device in the South Pacific, following the magnetic lines of force and coming in over the the North Pacific. And remember, we had to uh, give them the position that they should be be at, and we didn't know the magnetic field too well. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I'd forgotten about that. But, uh, actually, I was more involved in, in setting the shell up. Uh, yeah, well, uh, I, I guess I was analyzing more, the shell and so. I was more involved in trying to predict where to put the fleet in the North Atlantic. Yeah. And first, first time we told the fleet to go to such and such a latitude and longitude, and they went there. And then after the uh, the first uh, attempt, before they did the second one. We, we knew more, and so we changed the position, and the f fleet went full steam off in the opposite direction. <laughs> it was quite an operation. I bet. Uh, the, uh, the other thing that came out of that was we realized that one of the detectors in the uh, Explorer 4, we, we didn't do the detectors. That was actually Van Allen and his group up at Iowa State. Uh, but one of the detectors happened to be directional, and we noticed that because we could see uh, periodic changes in the radiation patterns. And we also knew something about the dynamics of the satellite. We had learned that from Explorer 1, that we remember these were long, almost baseball bat shaped vehicles. And uh, when you spin them up, it turns out that the most stable spin would be a flat spin around the center, sort of like a propeller. And so uh, we were able to look at the radio, at the RF frequency are the RF patterns from the telemetry and from that deduce the spin angle or the angle between the spin axis and where we were looking and from that we're able to put together the the orientation of the, of the vehicle in space as a function of time and match that to the radiation patterns and from that we were able then to look at the uh, angular distribution of these electrons on the magnetic field lines so that was a that was my first publication. That was in the uh, Journal of Geophysical Research. I remember that. And also my master's thesis. <laughs> so that was a good piece of work. Yeah, Bob. I thought so. Thank well, you. well, well done. Um, do you want to comment on the uh, the data analysis out at Livermore, or did you go to Livermore? Oh yeah, uh, when Livermore was it? It was uh, Stanford. I went to the meeting at Stanford Research. That's okay, right. well, there, there was, was another meeting at Livermore. Yeah, I, was, I wasn't in on that one. Okay, the DARPA uh, wanted very badly to get the data from the Argus experiment analyzed very quickly. So they took a team of people and locked us up in Livermore and told us we had to stay at Livermore until we finished the analysis. <laughs> so we spent a couple weeks, Christophilos uh, yeah. and, and the others, uh, Finishing the analysis of the of the sound, but there was a meeting at, at Stanford. Yeah, that was a later one, I think, that I, I was able to make a presentation at. Yeah, I think I was too junior for the for the Livermore. Oh, right. <laughs> that was all all the all the big wigs there. But, uh, I mean, I was just a young BS physicist at the time. So <laughs> anyway, that was uh, as I say, that was about as much fun as I've ever had since I've been working. Uh, well, what came after the Argus project? Uh, more satellites, I guess. Yeah, we had several more satellite launches. Uh, the one I guess I was most involved in and had the most fun with uh, was the uh, S-15, I believe it was called, the Gamma Ray 
the very first gamma ray telescope. Uh, this was a joint venture that we were doing with uh, Gordon Gormeyer uh, at MIT. And the MIT people built this gamma telescope, which was a series of scintillations. And, and Krauschar, too. Bill oh, I Krauschar. forgot. Yeah, I forgot. Bill about. Krauschar was also. Well, he was where? At, uh, well, he was MIT, MIT also. also. He, he was, okay. I think, the PI. He was the PI. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, anyway, uh, this one had a very, very high eccentric orbit. I've forgotten how many Earth radii it went up. And, uh, but then the perigee was where it was launched, and that was only a few hundred kilometers up. And again, uh, th this type of orbit has some very interesting effects due to the sun and moon. The perturbations due to the lunar and solar perturbations uh, would tend to either increase the perigee height or decrease the perigee height, again, depending on where you launched it. And so I did quite a few of these celestial mechanic calculations to try to get the phase of the moon and the sun right uh, to make sure that we didn't have the perigee running down into the Earth's atmosphere a few days after launch, which would be very embarrassing. But it got launched uh, successfully and everything was, was uh, fine. Of course, we had nothing to do with the uh, uh, gamma ray astronomy. That was really MIT's uh, function. But we were looking at the data, and all of a sudden, I noticed that uh, we picked up a huge amount of uh, radiation <laughs> where we didn't really expect to see it. And so we started looking at the thing and, and uh, watched it, and it looked very much like an Argus shell that we had seen back in the Argus days. <laughs> so uh, we alerted the, uh, let's see, who did we talk to? I guess the Defense Atomic Support? I guess so, yes. Someone like it that. was, yeah. And it turned out we had picked up a, uh, a Russian uh, space nuclear burst. Apparently it was part of an anti-ballistic missile uh, test that apparently the CIA didn't even know about. And uh, so we picked this up and sort of tracked it. And uh, later on it was confirmed that indeed that's really what happened. I remember going up and giving a, a paper to the uh, base of review uh, on our what, what we had found on that. Again, a lot of fun. <laughs> well, there was another interesting event. Uh, remember, there was a meteoroid shield in, in front of the uh, sensitive detector. And I, maybe you were involved in calculating how thick that should be and so forth. I don't remember that offhand, Chuck. Okay, well, somebody well, else did that. Huh? Well, okay, what happened was that an erroneous signal was sent up to the satellite. And there had been a provision to blow off the shield at the very end of the program to, because they didn't think the detector would last very long. But it got blown off early, but it turned out the, the meteoroid environment wasn't as bad as had been predicted, and so it, the whole thing worked much better with the shield off and, and lasted for the full full mission, but uh, Van Allen pulled his hair for a, for a while, for, not Van Allen, Crouch, Bill Crouchard yeah. pulled his hair for a while when the shield was, was blown off by mistake, but it, it turned out to be a, a fortuitous uh, improvement in the, the whole mission. Well, I guess that was the first evidence we had of the, uh, what the real meteorite environment did look like. Yeah. Uh, because up until then, the only real evidence that we had and this is the lead into another story uh, of the meteorite environment was the uh, microphone detectors that were flown on, let's see, I guess, uh, Spore. Well, we had one on Spore oh, 1. And Spore then 1 had one. Yeah, and then there was a, I think it was Spore 7, if I remember correctly, had yeah. big plates yeah. with little microphones on them. And a fellow named Mari Dubin at. Uh, Goddard was the, uh, or headquarters, I can't remember he was, where he was at the time. And he moved back and forth. Yeah, uh, he was the, the principal investigator on that. And uh, according to the microphone environments, we had meteoroids pinging, you know, all over the place. And uh, it was, uh, it looked like a rather intensive uh, uh, meteoroid environment that we might have a difficulty living through. Um, but anyway, that's another story. We'll get into that in a few minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That that led to the worry about how to how to measure. Right. Well, move on if that's the next thing. In well, I guess the next thing really was the uh, the Apollo program coming along, and the Saturn One uh, B, which was the forerunner, of course, to the Saturn Five, 
It was actually the upper stage of the Saturn V. And so some of the early launches of that, uh, I think the, they originally wanted to launch it with nothing but sand or concrete, I believe. And then uh, Chuck and some of the people got together and said, well, at least let's put something more substantial up. It might give some scientific return. So they wound up filling one or two of them with water. And that was Project High Water. Uh, I was not directly involved in High Water, but uh, uh, then I guess the next thing that came along was they said, well, you know, we're worried about this meteoroid environment going to the moon, so maybe what we should do is put large detector panels on one of these upper stages and uh, actually look at the penetration hazard of the meteorites. And that was actually, I guess, uh, suggested by uh, a colleague of mine at, at uh, Langley, Bill Kynard. Kynard had uh, flown also uh, up and well, just before that, I uh, can't remember what the satellite name was, but it was uh, it wasn't even one of the explorers, or was it? I can't remember. Uh, I don't remember. Either. I don't remember. Either. I think it was almost on a scout. It was a Langley. Vehicle. I think it was. Yeah, probably a scout. Model. But it had a whole cluster of what we call beer cans on it, and these were little, thin stainless steel, looked like a half beer can. They were pressurized, and it had a little pressure switch at the bottom of it, and. Uh, the pressure switch would, of course, trigger if the can was punctured by a meteoroid. And, um, of course, we didn't know an awful lot about meteoroid penetration. Uh, we didn't really have a very good model to match the momentum that we thought we were picking up with the microphones against penetration. But uh, the fact that we saw very few penetrations on this indicated that if these meteoroids are up there, they certainly didn't have very much penetrating power. So that was really, I think, the thing that spurred the, the Pegasus program, uh, which had these huge wings that folded out. Uh, it was 100, let's see, 100 square meters. I, I don't remember. Yeah, it was 100 square meters of area. It was large. Very, very large. And thick enough, eight mil, I think 16 mils thick for the thickest ones, which gets you know, pretty down, in, pretty much in the, the skin thickness of space vehicles. And so I wound up analyzing most of the data from the Pegasus and uh, was able to actually put together a fairly comprehensive picture of what the meteoroid uh, environment really looked like. There were, what, two or three flights? Uh, yeah, we had three, three, three Pegasus flights. Three flights right. of Pegasus. And, of course, a lot of that uh, we got involved in actually calibrating the detector panels. And to do that, we set up a, a light gas gun there at Marshall. Uh, we had Boeing actually built the gun itself. Uh, the gun itself uh, used a 20, 20, 20 millimeter aircraft uh, cannon cartridge, which we loaded with bullseye powder, which was a pistol, very high velocity or high burning rate pistol powder, and used that to launch a Lexan projectile that went down into a, a tube that was then tapered uh, to squeeze the projectile forward. It was known as an accelerated reservoir gas gun. And then the launch tube at the end of that was a hypodermic needle about a sixteenth inch in diameter with a little plastic pellet in it, which was our simulated meteoroid. And um, this was actually capable. I think we actually got speeds of up to 11 kilometers per second, which was actually orbital velocity there in the lab. And we're able to do a lot of the penetration work and actually refine some of the penetration models. In the meantime, I've been also involved in some of the uh, shock hydrodynamic calculations of what actually goes on when the shock front of a very high velocity object encounters a solid object. And uh, from that work, actually, I developed a uh, quantum statistical mechanical model uh, equation of state for various metals. And that was my PhD dissertation. <laughs> so, a, piece, a very needed piece of work. Yeah. And, uh, so anyway, that was, uh, uh, and let's see, at the same time, I guess, we also had some low-light level television cameras that we purchased, and we're using those to do meteor studies, actually looking at the vi uh, visible trails. So putting all of that together with the, uh, with the beer can data for the very small stuff, uh, the Pegasus data for the intermediate stuff, and then the light curves that we were picking up from the... Uh, uh, low, light, low light level television cameras, we put together, I guess, a model which is still primarily the, the main I, model. I, this, this I, I think that's still the, yeah. 
the, the baseline model for the meteorite environment? In order to uh, <laughs> complete the, the work, we, we still had this microphone data with all of this you know, incessant pinging of meteoroids on it, and so I was very suspicious of that. We were able to get a, um, a duplicate set of microphones, and I, I figured one of two things must be going on. Either radiation was somehow triggering the microphone, or thermal creaking just from the from the uh, uh, going in and out of the sunlight. So we actually took these microphones, took them up to Oak Ridge, and put them in a hot cell and irradiated them with. Uh, oh, I can't remember whether. I guess it was just neutrons, uh, whatever, and uh, couldn't see any kind of a, an effect from that. So then we thermal cycled them, and sure, sure enough, just like a tin roof creaks when the sun goes behind a cloud, uh, I think we were able to show that most of the, quote, meteoroid data was actually nothing but thermal creaks. And uh, Maury Dubin and I didn't get along too well after that. <laughs> anyway, we, we finally had a, had a decent picture. And, uh, the, uh, Maury had trouble getting along with people. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we had a lot of fun, though. Uh, well, see. what came next in your career has oh, been goodness. pretty exciting so far. Yeah, it sure was. Um, well, let me see. Uh, Somewhere along there, we asked you to move from astrophysics into materials. Yeah, actually, that sort of came off, uh, sort of in a gradual thing. We uh, um, got interested in, well, let's see, I guess it was after the Apollo. Uh, we got concerned about contamination, and this was in, I guess, the run-up to the uh, Skylab. Uh, Skylab, of course, had you know, all sorts of telescopes, the, uh, uh, the ATM, which was the uh, Apollo telescope mount, and there was a concern about the, the induced environment from the vehicle itself. Uh, materials outgassing, uh, particles flaking off and floating around it and so forth. So there was a big committee that was put together to examine the contamination problem. And so one of the things I got involved in at the time was uh, developing uh, a deposition monitor using quartz microbalances. Uh, these are little quartz crystals that uh, you oscillate at something like 20 megahertz and uh, the oscillation frequency, of course, changes if materials deposit on them. So we actually built a couple of these detectors. I say we did. Uh, we had a, a contractor, let's see, Atlantic Research Corporation, I believe it was, out on the West Coast. I don't know why they were called Atlantic, but <laughs> they were in California. But anyway, they built some of these detectors. I was responsible for the, uh, I guess, overseeing the development and design of the detectors and the testing of them. And we actually flew these on, uh, we flew a couple of them uh, close to the, uh, the Earth Resources window, which they were very concerned about. This was a very high quality quartz window down in the bottom of the Skylab that was supposed to look at the Earth. And so there was concern about uh, gunk and material, not gas, gassing that would collect on the window. So we had these uh, monitors down there to monitor that. Didn't see too much during the clean part of the flight. But we got a pretty good amount of uh, stuff on when, we, when the rendezvous with the, uh, the Apollo command module came up to change crews. We could sure see that happen. So that was another, I guess, uh, effort in the contamination business. We sort of the lead into the materials business because that had to do with the outgassing of materials, deposition of materials, and so forth. So anyway, um, after the Apollo program and the Skylab program, um, there was a big effort at Marshall to develop uh, various uses of microgravity. And uh, I got in sort of late on this thing. It was originally, I guess, uh, Matt Siebel was really the guy that was doing most was of the early on, work. Well, the IECM for the shuttle came oh, along. Oh, that's right. Yeah, uh, we, we put sort of in that in. Yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. We. We got concerned about what was going to be on the shuttle, uh, the contamination environment in the shuttle bay, 
And so I was chair of a group called the Pigwig, I believe it was, the PGWG. <laughs> Fine Particle name. and Gases Working Fine group. name for the Yeah, group. anyway. <laughs> so uh, for the early shuttle flights, we proposed a, uh, a monitor, which was a large box about the size of this table, to sit in the shuttle bay. And uh, it had a number of instruments, uh, including a mass spectrometer, uh, various uh, these quartz microbalances, Oh goodness! Uh, humidity detectors, uh, trace gas analyzers, and the whole whole nine yards. And uh, that was built and actually flown on what the first several yeah, shuttle right. flights. Um, it was even picked up by the shuttle arm and moved out to monitor the gases leaving the shuttle. Unfortunately, I didn't really get to see the the fruits of that uh, because it, before that got to fly, I sort of got drafted into the materials science business. <laughs> or at least the microgravity there, business. There was a reorganization at Marshall, right. and the Space Science Lab was asked to take the lead on materials research. Um, so you, I, you got tagged. I, I got to that. be a uh, material scientist. <laughs> 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 so anyway, that uh, I got started, I guess. Uh, I've spent quite a bit of time going to and from headquarters. Uh, working with Jim Brett at the time was head of the program and then later uh, the program was transferred over to the Space Sciences group and John Carruthers was brought in from Bell Labs to run it and John and I got to be really good friends in fact I, I learned most of what I know about material science from John I spent a lot of time in headquarters working kind of directly with him and uh, trying to whip the people at Marshall into shape to you know, get some of the work done that John really wanted to see done there. So uh, I got pretty heavily involved in, in the microgravity work. Um, and really, uh, in order to do that, one of the big problems that we had in the program before was a lot of the experiments, uh, which naturally were sort of try and see experiments because nobody really quite knew what to expect uh, from the microgravity environment. And so there was a big committee, I guess, that looked at the Stamps Committee, I've forgotten what Stamps stood for, uh, that looked at the whole program and said, well, you know, you guys have been flying all these experiments, some of them on Skylab, some of them on Apollo Soyuz program, and what have you really learned from it? And so there was a lot of, you know, kind of interesting little tidbits, but no real science uh, to drive the thing. And so John Carruthers insisted that we really have a good science background to uh, to underpin this program. So uh, I then became the division chief of the microgravity science program at Marshall in the space science division and built uh, what I consider an absolutely first rate material science group there. Uh, we, I recruited uh, some very good people, uh, Alex Lahosky and Frank Sofran, we got from uh, McDonnell Douglas. Uh, they were both really extremely good crystal growers, uh, solid state physicists, and so forth. And we picked up uh, some really good people all the way around. And I built, I say I built. I, you, you did it. Well, <laughs> fortunately, Don't I had some, some help. You well, we, you know, we had the support of Marshall Management, so we, we were able to make offers and put together a really good, good group of people. Uh, Publication-wise, I would put this group of people up against anybody anywhere. Uh, they uh, developed a number of experiments that were flown on oh, the various space lab missions, uh, the microgravity uh, emphasis missions, uh, USML-1, uh, and then all the ones that came after that. And uh, really just did an incredible amount of really, really excellent work. Um, much of that is recorded in the, hist in the uh, journals. As I say, they had a publication rate that was, would be second to none of any national lab I know of. Um, but anyway, that was getting up to the point in my career where I was getting close to 55. And there was a magical thing that can happen in government, you can retire at 55. <laughs> So I, I decided that yeah, I'd probably done enough there and maybe I ought to change careers. So um, I was lucky enough to um, be offered a position at UAH as a, well, interestingly enough, uh, 
I'm a professor of material science, but there's no material science department. So I'm actually tenured in chemistry as a material science professor. <laughs> Don't ask. Well, you know, you, you skipped over one thing. Let oh. me back up and ask about your tour at NASA headquarters. Oh, well, okay. Uh, yeah, the uh, Carruthers decided that he had enough of government bureaucracy, and so he decided to leave NASA and went off to work for uh, uh, Intel, I guess think it was, in it? Yeah. And so he uh, had a successor that came on board. Um, help me, I can't think of the guy's name. I can't either. Uh, I can picture him. It'll come to me in a minute, senior moment here. Uh, but anyway, the program sort of was taken over by people that were non-scientists and really didn't quite understand what was what was happening and uh, so I was sort of drafted to go kind of commute to and from headquarters. I spent uh, I guess a year practically uh, I would go to Washington I think on Tuesday morning or no, Monday morning I guess it was and come back on Thursday afternoon. I was teaching a course here at UAH Statistical Mechanics on Thursday evening so I'd get off the plane, go teach the course, and then spend the weekend at home and go back to Washington the next day <laughs> to try to put the program back on, on even keel. And uh, eventually, this gentleman, whose name I still can't <laughs> come up with, uh, moved out or retired or did something, I've forgotten which, and so they asked me to come up and be the uh, acting director for the microgravity science program. So I spent a year in Washington trying to whip this program back into shape. One of the things that we realized was that some of the work that had been done on the earlier space stations, or space labs rather, um, we were getting results that didn't really quite agree with what we would expect to see in microgravity. And uh, we did quite a few calculations. In fact, this was about the time that space station was being born. And uh, so we needed to come up with some criteria for the sp uh, space station uh, low gravity environment. Well, it was pretty obvious uh, that some of the things we were doing on the shuttle where they would you know, maneuver back and forth to put the sun on the bottom or whatever was causing all sorts of disturbances in the program. And so I developed some models to show how this actually did work and actually put together an experiment uh, that we flew on, let's see, STS-95, I believe it was, uh, when John Glenn was on, mm -hmm. where we had some small uh, heated ampules with uh, thermocouples in them. And uh, this actually came out of a <laughs> another venture that Chuck got me into. Uh, this had to do with this... Uh, what was the name of the group uh, from Japan? That oh, we, the Just Apple. This, just, this is all after you moved to UH now. That's right, it sure was. I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. All right, let's just go back to NASA headquarters. Uh, anyway, we decided that uh, one of the problems with early, some of the early experiments was that we really didn't have a quiet enough microgravity environment. So Bonnie Dunbar and I got together and uh, put together the plans for this USML-1, the first microgravity emphasis mission, where we would fly the vehicle such that there would be minimum disturbances uh, from vehicle motions in order to really produce the microgravity environment we really needed to do, do these experiments. And uh, actually I did leave NASA I guess before USML-1 flew. I did have a couple experiments on USML-1 though. Uh, let's see, we were looking at Marangoni convection, it was one of them. Uh, if you had any kind of an interface in a, in a uh, solidifying material uh, this drove some rather strong convective forces. Uh, we looked at the stability of various liquid bridges, and we looked at the breakup of uh, long cylindrical uh, cylinders, or uh, uh, liquid cylinders, I should say. And so we had some very nice work on that and published several papers on it. Uh, but so that's of course, sort of the transition from NASA to, to UAH. UAH. That's correct. UAH. Right. Planned while you were at NASA and finished while you right. after you got to UAH. So after I got here, then uh, I taught a number of different courses, but the one I sort of settled into was the uh, 
introduction to material science, which is the first year graduate course. Since we don't have an undergraduate program in material science here, uh, we take material science students from either chemistry or physics or some of the engineering disciplines. And uh, so I put together a course that was sort of a catch-all course to go back to material they would have learned if they had been in an engineering program back in the sophomore year. But uh, since it was a graduate introductory course, uh, it had to be taught at a somewhat higher level, so I sort of upgraded the basic prop and materials course that the engineers would, would take as a sophomore and uh, made it into a graduate course. Threw in a good deal of physics, right? Well, yeah, quite a bit of solid state physics. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Uh, there's an aversion from the engineers to taking solid state physics, so I decided to sort of disguise it and sort of teach it solid state to them with, without them realizing yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> slip it in where they don't, they don't exactly. notice it. So anyway, that's what I've been doing for the most part, uh, is teaching this course. And, I've uh, put together a, a series of notes that I've used since there really isn't a textbook uh, that's available. What I had to do was to use a, a sophomore level engineering textbook and then supplement it with handout notes uh, to make the course actually uh, a true graduate course. So anyway, I've been compiling these notes over the years and uh, been using those actually to teach the course for the last two years and finally I actually uh, worked out an arrangement with a publisher and uh, they have agreed to make this a textbook. So I'm negotiating right now with Taylor and Francis to uh, actually have this thing published. It, it will be a unique book. There's nothing well, covering you're, you're the right. same territory. And, uh, you know, the sad thing about it is there's not a decent solid state physics book out there at the introductory level. Uh, the gold standard, of course, is Ashcroft and Merman, but you know, unless you had a, a master's in physics, I wouldn't, wouldn't want to wish that off on anybody. Certainly a person coming from an engineering background with no physics background would really be totally lost in it. Uh, it's certainly the finest book there is, but uh, it's at too high a level for introductory students. And uh, the other book, of course, which is widely used, is uh, Cattell. Uh, old Charlie's kind of getting up in the ages. I mean, I had my first course in solid state physics out of his second edition back in the 60s, and he's up to the seventh edition now, <laughs> or maybe even eighth, who knows. Uh, and I've taught several courses out of it, but the students didn't like it, I didn't like it. Uh, unfortunately, each new edition took out some of the real meat and tried to put in newer stuff, and they did it in such a way where it really wasn't uh, well uh, well explained, I guess is probably the best way to do it. And so the book has just sort of fallen from from favor. Uh, if you read the book reviews of it in Amazon.com, uh, you wonder why anybody would choose it for a text. So what I'm hoping is that this book of mine would sort of maybe fill the bill sort of between, it's not really at the level of Cattell, but it would be a really good introduction to a more advanced course, such as uh, Ashcroft and Merman. Well, you've had a very interesting and exciting <laughs> career. Uh, well, it's been a lot of fun, Chuck. That's all I can say. I've really enjoyed it. I, I wouldn't take anything for it, any of it. And uh, I just feel real privileged and blessed to, to have been able to do something I really loved all my life and get paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> any uh, final thoughts you'd like to leave for posterity and for all the young people that are now at Marshall oh, uh, goodness. trying to do some exciting things that they like to do? Well, unfortunately, you know, our friends at Marshall have sort of uh, thrown science out the window. And so there's a lot of engineering work going on there, and I'm sure it will be very exciting. Uh, I have a hard time believing it will be as exciting as the career I had. But then again, you know, you can't really go back and relive it. Uh, there will be other new, newer things going on. I'm sure back when they, after they finally get the, uh, whatever it is, they're going to go to the moon <laughs> and build, that there will be exciting and fun things to do. Uh, probably more in the line of engineering than in the sciences. But, you know, engineering is fun too, so I don't, I wouldn't uh, disparage that. Any uh, final thoughts about space station? Well, 
Or is that putting you on the spot? <laughs> yeah, I'm very frustrated because I spent a lot of my career at Washington, you know, working with space station problems and and trying to make sure we had a vehicle that uh, could do good experiments on it. And we succeeded in doing that. And so now it looks like NASA's position is to simply complete it and leave it. And I just feel it's a real incredible waste of taxpayers' money. And we've put, what, $50 billion into this thing and uh, really have not realized the science, science potential of it. And I'm disappointed and somewhat disgusted uh, that the agency has chosen to do that. But, you know, that's a decision they have to make. I guess in order to do the newer things they're doing now, they can't really afford to to do the science they originally planned to do on station, but I, I'm just very disappointed that they didn't follow through on it. And I think there's a lot of potential there that could be realized. One sort of final thought that I should have asked earlier, uh, how much of the uh, findings from space experiments end up in a book like the one you did? Is there, there much feedback uh, into that? I've used a number of examples um, in dealing with the missile materials. Uh, I go back to the work we did at the, at the drop tower that Marshall, uh, where we were actually solidifying some of these immiscible materials. And of course, I always love to tell the story of the uh, discovery of superconductivity here at UAH, high temperature su superconductivity, which actually came from some of the stuff we did at Marshall. Uh, just for the record, I guess, uh, we had done some, I say we, uh, Lou Lacey and Gunter Otto, I believe it was, uh, had done some work way back when we were just getting into the microgravity business, uh, looking at alloy systems that have immiscible uh, liquid phases. And these phases, of course, separate in normal gravity. So the idea was if you take gravity away, maybe you can make these alloys in highly dispersed forms that you can't do on the ground. And they actually did some very nice work in the drop tower over there. This is the uh, tower that was used originally to look at how uh, fuel and fuel tanks behaved in low gravity. And so they did some very nice experiments where they quenched uh, a sample of uh, bismuth lead, I believe it was, uh, which is an immiscible system, and got a very nice dispersed uh, phase out of it, or sample, and they were looking for new superconductivity mechanisms. Uh, this was based on some work that a Russian Ginsburg had done. Uh, he essentially suggested that perhaps uh, exciton could be a, a, a coupling mechanism that uh, would be stronger than the Cooper pairs that we normally look at for our superconducting mechanisms. So they were looking for uh, materials that had a lot of exon, exciton production. And they got some, some interesting resistivity measurements at low temperature, but it wasn't superconducting. So uh, my friend at uh, University of Houston, uh, Paul Chu, Chu had gotten very interested in uh, superconductivity also at the time and also magnetic materials. And this was also about the time that I had proposed a uh, space vacuum system. And Chu had gotten very interested in that because he was working with some rather nasty materials that nobody that had an MBE system wanted to put in their nice clean vacuum system. So he thought the space vacuum might be a really good way to do that. So we got to have a, a pretty good relationship. I gave a paper to it, the American Vacuum Society on that, proposing what could be done. And uh, so Chu and I got to be pretty close friends. And then he, he found out about this work that Lacey and Otto had done. So he sent one of his students, uh, M.K. Wu, up here to duplicate the, or try to duplicate their experiment. Well, while Wu was here, uh, the work that was done by Ben Nortz and, and Mueller on uh, high temperature super superconductivity, uh, I guess, was published, or at least Chu found out about it. And so uh, he and M.K. Wu had gone to the, uh, let's see, it was the MRS, Materials Research Meeting in Boston, in December of 1996, was it? That's right. Yeah. And uh, so he and M.K. got in the hotel room and looked at what had been reported by both the Japanese and the, the uh, people in Switzerland. 
and sort of divided up the periodic table and uh, went back to work. And <laughs> so they worked all during Christmas holidays. A young fellow named Jim Ashburn was actually uh, uh, Wu's student. Now, Wu would come here as an assistant as a, professor. As an assistant professor, that's right. And uh, I don't even know it was on Christmas Eve, but anyways, during the Christmas holidays, uh, they were working late at night, and that was when Ashburn happened to hit on the right combination of the uh, yttrium barium uh, copper oxide one two three formulation. And I actually, think it was a little later, but in the okay. Field. And actually uh, saw the the uh, superconductivity at ninety five degrees, which was a big breakthrough because uh, that puts it above the the freezing temperature of nitrogen at seventy seven which means now you have a superconducting material that you don't have to have liquid helium for. And so this made a big, big splash. And uh, I like to tell my students this story that, you know, this happened right over here at Wilson Hall. Right. <laughs> so it's, uh, unfortunately, we didn't see the benefits of it <laughs> for reasons I won't go into. Okay. But, uh, well, Bob, it's been a lot of fun going going through your career. and Yeah, it really has. I. You, you're, you're still hard hard at it, so yeah. keep keep going and have more fun with the rest of your career. <laughs> well, it's, you know, if you don't enjoy doing what you're doing, then you really shouldn't be doing it. That's been my philosophy. Well, that's and, uh, a good philosophy to end the interview yeah. on. Thank you very much for well, coming. Thank you.